Okay, so we're going to take a look at section 84 today. Um, just by way of a reminder, Cicero has been talking about Antony's use or rather misuse of the auguries um, in the election of Dolabella. Um, so let's pick up and see what we get this time. So he starts off, sed ad rogantiam hominis insolentiam quae cognoscite. Uh, so there's an exclamation here. Uh, said I'm sure you know but um, and then straight to the imperative at the end cognoscite recognize um, see maybe notice is a good way of translating it so notice recognize and then the two objects uh, ad rogantiam hominis the arrogance of the man and then the que on insolentiam, que is linking those together. So the arrogance of the man and his insolence, or you could put hominis with both as well and say the arrogance and insolence of the man. So, but recognise the arrogance and insolence of the man, i.e. of Antony. Well, what does he mean by that? He's going to go on and explain it now, but it's to do with this misuse of the auguries, taking something which is sacred and then using it for your own purposes. So he says... Quam diu tu voles, um, for as long as, so that's quam diu, diu obviously you'll know as for a long time, so quam diu literally means sort of however long, so for as long as tu voles, voles is the future form of wallow, obviously in the second person, so for as long as you will want, or as long as you will wish, we wouldn't say that in English, but the use of the future there is quite interesting, because it creates a kind of sense of power that Antony has over it. So it's a sort of indeterminate into the future. For as long as you will want it, you know, so as long as you want, Witiosus Consul Dolabella. Uh, so literally, Dolabella, a flawed consul. So you're going to need a verb to be in there. Uh, so for as long as you wish it, Dolabella, you're going to want uh, erit. You know, Dolabella will be, uh, but probably again more naturally in English, Dolabella is. So for as long as you wish it, Dolabella is a witiosus consul. Um, witiosus is an adjective form of a word we've had before, which is witium, which means a kind of flaw or a defect. Um, so he means in terms of the way in which he has been elected rather than in terms of his personality. Remember that, Do um, that Cicero has some self-interest in Dolabella being seen as uh, a rightful consul. Anyway, so uh, bad, corrupt, I like flawed as a translation for witiosus, um, but you may wish to, you know, inter interpret it as you wish, basically. It's a kind of shorthand for Dolabella is a consul who was elected in a flawed manner. Um, so that suits Antony's purposes at times. So for as long as you wish it, Dolabella is a flawed consul. Rusus. Uh, Rusus, you undoubtedly will come across before meaning again, um, but it doesn't mean that in quite the way you would anticipate here. It's more like the English usage, then again, so more sort of on the other hand, you know. So then again, cum wales, when you wish it, same principle. Um, this almost has the force of a kind of if clause here. So it, it, again, it's about power. It's Antony has engineered a situation where he is in control. So cum wales, whenever you might wish it, whenever you will wish it, literally, salvis auspicis creatus. Um, Dolabella is, again, the uh, the nominative here along with creatus. Whenever you wish it, Dolabella, creatus, this is very compressed, you need an S with that as well, or you need to, at least to imply one. Dolabella was made, was created, a consul, understood, Salvis auspicis, so little tiny ablative absolute here, um, with the auspices being uh, safe, sound, maybe better for um, salvus, um, just without any problems, basically. You know, so uh, whenever you wish it, Dolabella was made consul uh, with sound auspices, i.e. when it suits you that Dolabella wasn't elected properly, you'll take advantage of that. It suits you that he was at that point, then you'll uh, you'll accept the fact that he was he was elected properly. So Cicero is really hammering home the idea that uh, 
Antony is manipulating a situation here of his own creation as well. So he's going to talk about that a little bit more. Si nihil est cum augur is verbis nuntiat, quibus tu nuntiasti, confiterete cum alio die dixeris sobrium non fuisse. There's quite a lot going on there. Um, but it's basically a conditional clause to start off with. So, si nihil est, literally, if it is nothing. Um, he's talking about the words which Anthony uses, so you may wish to translate this as if it means nothing, but literally, if it is nothing, cum auger is verbis nuntiat, when an auger nuntiat pronounces, um, announces, whichever you prefer, these verbies with these words. Uh, it might be more natural in English just to say, you know, proclaims these words or something like that, but the, the, the construction is ablative with these words. So when an, when an auger announces with these words, if it is nothing when an auger announces with these words, and then a little explanation of those, quibus tu nuntiasti, with which you proclaimed, or with which you announced. So quibus again is ablative, so it's instrumental. Then two, uh, obviously referring to Anthony, uh, nuntiasti is a syncopated form, so it should be nuntiawisti, uh, but he's just contracted it a little bit. So with which you proclaimed, confitere te. Um, confitere is the deponent verb confite, or so although this looks like an infinitive, it clearly can't be because it's a deponent verb, um, it's an imperative. So just beware of those. I'm sure we've come across them before. Uh, but he, the deponent infinitive looks very much like, a, uh, sorry, deponent imperative rather, looks very much like an infinitive. So, admit, confitere, acknowledge, confess, and then that's going to leap leap into an ablative, uh, uh, an indirect statement with an accusative infinitive. My apologies. So, admit yourself, so admit that you, and then the infinitive is down at the end here, known for we say, not to have been. So admit that you were not. What was he not? Well, accusative here, agreeing with te, sobrium. So admit that you were not sober. So acknowledge, confess that you were not sober. It's, a little, uh, it's been clunked in a slightly awkward place in English. Um, you could get away with it. Admit that you, cum alio die dixeris, when you said, cum dixeris. So the dixeris is perfect subjunctive. So it must be a when that come. So when you said alio die, there's the standard formula on another day. So the thing which calls the election into question. So admit that you, when you said on another day, sobrium non fuisse, you were not sober. It's an interesting idea, this, because the logic doesn't really follow. Um, there's no reason why Antony should have been drunk on this particular day. Um, just because he used these words, you know, clearly uh, Cicero knows that the formula alio da does have some power, so it's not nothing, as he's just uh, just um, suggested, si nihil est, if it is nothing. So if, it's, if it means nothing, admit that you were drunk. Well, there is a kind of logic there in Cicero's mind. You can follow the, fa the pattern of thought. Cicero makes a lot throughout the Philippics of Antony's approach to indulgence and particularly drink. Um, there will be another one later on in this passage. Um, so it's an easy dig at him. Well, if you didn't mean it, then you must have been drunk because that's what we all know about you. So there, there is a kind of odd logic to it, but it's, it's not... A train of thought which uh, which makes particular sense if you know nothing about Antony and you know nothing about the situation. Um, it's an opportunity to get another jibe in him, basically. So, if it means nothing when an auger uh, pronounces with these words, the ones with which you announced, admit that you, when you said on another on another day, were not sober. Sin est aliqua vis in istis verbis, ea quae sit. Algo a collega requiro. So this is the other side of the uh, of the of the conditional clause. If it's nothing, then this. Seen. If not, or but if. Okay, so but if I think it's probably easier here. But if est aliqua vis. If there is 
Aliqua with some force, some strength. In istis verbis, in these words, i.e. if there is some power to them. Ea quae sit, little indirect question. Uh, quae sit, what it is, and then the ea is just referring back to the power. What this power is, or what it is, algo a collega requiro. So requiro. Uh, means something like uh, to inquire, to demand, you know. Um, so, auger, an auger, or as an auger, because he's talking about himself, because the subject of the verb is uh, is first person, isn't it? As an auger, re quiro, I seek to know our collega, from my colleague. Collega is Anthony, because Anthony is also an auger, as we've discussed in some links before. Um, again, this might seem a little bit cryptic, but the idea is that if there is some force to those words, which is sort of outside the normal, and the, you know, the, the uh, Cicero is is kind of demanding or suggesting rather that Antony has used this in an odd way. If there's no force, then to, to the words that you use, then you must have been drunk. Uh, if there is some force, then I want to know what it is because you're not using this in the ordinary way. You know, um, so please do enlighten us. Um, it's all. Uh, vicious and slightly sarcastic, basically. You know, do educate me, Anthony. Let me know what you meant when you said those words, if it wasn't the usual thing. He's going to leave the uh, the issue of Dolabella's election for the moment, though, uh, to go on to really what he's been building up for, building up to for a little while, and that's the uh, idea of the Lupercalia. So let's go ourselves there and talk a little bit what, about what that is. Said ne forte ex multis rebus gestis marci Antoni rem unam pulcherimam transiliat oratio ad lupercalia veniamus. So take it back to the beginning. Said but nay. Uh, this is a, a sort of lest in this instance, yeah, um, a, a, a sort of negative purpose. So that not, yeah, but but lest forte by chance. Ex multis rebus gestis, Marci Antoni, from the many uh, things which have been done of Marcus Antonius. So maybe from Marcus Antonius's very uh, sorry, sorry from Marcus Antonius's many achievements, but less from Marcus Antonius's many achievements. Rem unam pulcherimam, one most beautiful thing, transiliat. It may leap over, and then oratio is actually the subject, so you need to move then move that further back. So, but lest my speech might leap over um, from uh, from the many things, uh, sorry, from the many achievements of Marcus Antonius, one most beautiful thing, ad Lupercalia Veniamus. Let us come to the Lupercalia. Um, it's effectively just a a very very flowery way of saying I'm going to move on to, to the next thing but again it's heavily laden with sarcasm you know um, I doubt very much if uh, Cicero really believes that that Antony has ex multis rebus gestis to choose from you know or at least not positive ones anyway um, the use of the x there is interesting as well um, it's a kind of partitive usage so out of from the many achievements of Marcus Antonius uh, lest my speech, my oratio, jump over the rem unam pulcherimam, the one most beautiful thing. Yeah. Uh, and of course, he really doesn't mean that. He's massively sarcastic. The thing that he's going to talk about now, um, he has no admiration for at all. You, know, you, could, um, you could essentially replace pulcherimam with something negative and the sentence would still make sense because he doesn't mean what he's saying at all. So lest by chance my speech might leap over out of the many achievements of Marcus Antonius, the one most beautiful thing, ad Lupercalia Veniamus. Let us come to the Lupercalia. Um, and the Veniamus is a kind of justive subjunctive there. Let us do it. It's a suggestion. Okay. Uh, what is the Lupercalia? There is a massive note on this um, in the Ingo Gildenhard, um commentary which I've sent you, which gives you a lot of detail about the Lupercalia, but essentially it's a fertility ritual um, with 
people, teams of people representing uh, Romulus and Remus, uh, they'll sacrifice a goat um, and, and smear the initiates um, to the ritual in the blood and, uh, and, and milk. Uh, and then they will chop up the goat's hide and make little loincloths for themselves. So the whole ritual is done naked apart from these loincloths which are made out of the goat's skin. Um, and along with the loincloths which they make out of the goat skin, uh, they'll also make uh, little goat hide whips for themselves as well. And essentially, the people taking part in the festival will run around uh, various bits of the city, and every time they meet somebody, they'll give them a little flick with their with their whip. And the idea is that if you flick a woman, that woman will become pregnant. So it's a fertility ritual um, for the future prosperity of the city. Uh, it's quite a big deal and Anthony has quite a major role in it. Um, the festival itself is not the reason why this is important though. Um, it's because it's the, a very famous scene. It's a scene which is found in Shakespeare's uh, Julius Caesar where Anthony chooses to um, present Caesar with a, with a diadem um, and, and basically, essentially in doing so offer him uh, the opportunity of becoming king of Rome. That's the big part of this. Uh, I'm not going to linger on that too long because there will be more opportunity to talk about that later on and potentially the various reasons for it. But that's why Cicero has, has turned the course of his speech to talk about this particular festival, um, which took place in February of 44. So just you know, a, a few weeks before Caesar was assassinated. Anyway, so he's raised the issue of the Lupercalia. Uh, and now he points out Antony's reaction. Uh, non dissimulat. He does not disguise. Presumably it. We're going to need something in English to fit, to fit in there. He does not disguise. He does not hide it. Patres conscripti is a term we've come across before. Conscript fathers, just referring to the Senate. Uh, Senate. Ad paret esse commotum. Uh, ad paret is an impersonal verb, so it is clear. Um, and then that introduces an accusative infinitive construction as well. It is clear that, an indirect statement. So it is clear. You haven't got an infinitive as a, uh, sorry, an accusative as a person though. So you need to imply an aum somewhere in this. It is clear, aum esse, that he is. So it is clear that he is commotum. Commotum, you've probably come across meaning sort of moved or something like that before. Um, it clearly has negative connotations here. So something like agitated is probably a good idea. It is clear that he is agitated. He knows that Cicero's got him on the ropes uh, with this one. Sudat, he sweats. Pallet, he is pale or he grows pale. So uh, you have to remember that Cicero never actually gave this speech. So he's imagining uh, a reaction, the reaction that he wants. And presumably had he actually spoken this speech, uh, he would have... Um, said these words or similar ones, regardless of the reaction that Anthony actually gave. You know, he wants people to, to, to know up front that what he did at the Lupercalia is not an acceptable thing. So regardless of Anthony's reaction, Cicero wants him sweaty and pale. Anyway, so he sweats, uh, he sweats, he is pale. You might want to put an and in there, uh, just a little ascendaton just to keep it flowing along. He sweats, he is pale. Quid libet. Modo, ne now say it, faciat. So quid libet, uh, a bit like quam diu earlier on, you know, quid libet, uh, whatever he wants, uh, you know, whatever is allowed, really. Uh, so whatever he wants, faciat, let him do. So again, the justice subjunctive there. So let him do whatever he wants, modo, ne now say it. Uh, this construction here has a sort of meaning as as long as he's not, you know. So as long as he's not sick, again, this is a reference to his uh, his uh, approach to, to alcohol uh, you're on. So let him do whatever he wishes, as long as he's not sick. Quad, referring back to the act of being sick, uh, a thing which, you know, in portico minucia fake it, a thing which he did in the Minutian colonnade. Um, Cicero mentions this elsewhere in the Philippics in quite a graphic description 
um, of Anthony coming out to do public business um, and promptly throwing up over his toga, you know, giving all sorts of details about stinking chunks of meat, you know, half digested food and that sort of thing. Uh, thankfully, he doesn't do that again here, but he's referenced it earlier on. So the people know what he's talking about again, but it's just another chance to, to get in there. What a disgrace Anthony is in the public arena, a man who has uh, a lack of self-control, which, of course, is one of the major virtues that the Romans prized. You know. So let him do whatever he wishes, as long as he's not sick, which he was in the Minutian uh, portico. The Minutian portico is just named after a man uh, called Marcus Minucius Rufus who built it. So don't worry too much about that. Uh, he's going to linger on this idea of him being sick in public just for a moment. Quae potest esse turpitudinis tantae defensio? Uh, what is able to be? Quae pot, potest esse? What is able to be? And then again, the subject is left right until the very end of the sentence, or the question rather. Defensio. What defence can there be? And then you've got in the middle this genitive modifying that. Turpidi sorry, I can't say that word today apparently. Turpitudinis tantai of such a great disgrace or dishonour or disgusting behaviour or something like that. Um, in English, you probably wouldn't use the genitive. You'd say for instead. So what defence is there for such outrageous behaviour? Defense is they're able to be for such outrageous behaviour. Cupio, our dear, I wish to hear it. I think you need under, under that. Ut videam, uh, purpose clause, so that I might see videam's present subjunctive. Ubi rhetoris sit tanta merces. So ubi merces sit is the starting point here. So where the fee is. And then Tanta is modifying Merkes. So where so great a fee is, Rhetoris, um, of the rhetorician. Uh, again, this is a slightly cryptic phrase. I think I've put a little note on this. Uh, elsewhere, he refers to, uh, in fact, later on in the selection that you're going to read, he refers to Antony paying various people out of the public purse um, for services to him. And one of them, um, is a teacher of rhetoric. So we'll talk about this more later. Yeah, but it's a, again another little nod to that. You know, uh, I want to hear it so that I can see where that great fee for the rhetorician is. Um, I what you got for your fee to that rhetorician. Um, the next section uh, compounds that a little bit further, but it is slightly disputed. It might just be. Um, a later addition to the text um, because it has a sort of explanatory nature to it. Id est ubi campus Leontinus appariat. Uh, that is where the um, field of Le and Leontini you know, uh, appariat uh, is evident. You know, and you can see why that doesn't quite work. There is a suggestion um, that this whole phrase can be taken to mean that something like uh, that is what he uh, that is what there is to show for the field of Leontini um, the field of Leontini again I'm sure I've written a note on this um, is part of the payment which Antony used to um, buy these services so he's giving away public land as well anyway this will be referred to later on so we're not going to worry too much about this now in terms of it being disputed I would attempt to put something in a translation um, myself but I wouldn't worry too much about trying to make it absolutely fit. Um, I think as long as you're aware of it and as, lo and as long as you're aware of its disputed quality and what it probably means and how it fits in, I think that's probably enough. Anyway, that's all for today. Thanks very much. Goodbye.